All right. Hey, everyone. This is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Mickey Koss. He's a Special Operations Forces veteran and West Point graduate who currently works at the Finance Corps of the U.S. Army. After falling deep down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin in early 2020, he started writing about Bitcoin as a proof of work project. He currently has published over 80 articles on Bitcoin in outlets like Forbes, Bitcoin Magazine and BitcoinNews.com. I'm happy that he's here. Welcome, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I, uh, As I told you before, like I, I read some of your articles and I, uh, I think it's really cool that... Um, you know, like you're in a in a normal job serving, and alongside you're uh, you're setting your foot into uh, you know the Bitcoin space, which I think is really cool, especially um, with your writing. So I thought it would be fun to uh, to invite you and uh, and have a jam on Bitcoin. But I I first wanted to check like which generation do you belong to? Um, I guess I'm a millennial. I was born in early 90s so i, I think i'm i think i'm kind of in the middle or tail end of I millennials think the, i think you're on the edge actually like i i also it's called bitcoin for millennials but i forgot <laughs> which uh which years those are i think i think you're on the tail end actually yeah 96 is uh is the is the last year so what's your experience of helping our generation understand bitcoin do you find it as hard as i do sometimes yeah, I think there's a lot of apathy, right? And so, you you know, you have the things in 08, like Occupy Wall Street, and everyone sort of wants to protest everything, but nobody wants to really take action and do anything of, of sort of substance, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you go sit on Wall Street and you yell about things for, what, a week or two, and then it sort of evaporates and nothing happens, nothing changes. But it, I, Bitcoin is a protest, but it's a peaceful protest because you're just sort of defunding the system that you find unconscionable or or corrupt and and then you're holding your money in a way that can't be devalued and so it's it's beneficial to you financially and it also pulls money from the system that you you claim to despise yeah it's funny right like i what i love about bit uh, about bitcoin and and doing the work right like you cannot only talk anymore you have to walk the walk right and as you illustrate here i think bitcoin is the perfect example of actually walking walking the walk uh last week i recorded with uh with jeff booth and i asked him like okay um you know how do you think bitcoin is going to develop etc like what does the future look like and he said well, the future is actually now, like you can do the thing right now, you know, like you can move away from the broken system that we all know is broken, right? And some people are just not really ready to accept it yet. But you can do that. You can do this now. You don't really have to wait, like there's actually uh, a door to the to the other side. So uh, yeah, I love that. I love that you say that too, because I, I, I didn't really think about that, about it like that before. But it's, I think more because, yeah, just been in Bitcoin for so long that uh, yeah I don't really um, yeah think like that anymore. But I think it's it's really important. Like I I saw you went down the rabbit hole in 2020, like early 2020. I think you then got it really quickly. To be honest, uh, you know t uh, it's taken me years. I think it's a lot of people that it takes takes longer than than you did. Like what 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 was that experience like going down that rabbit hole like can you describe what what that means for you yeah so it it started out um i was i was a commander at fort hood and one of my soldiers told me about mining and so i started diving in um he he was actually mining ethereum but none of that stuff made any sense to me but but bitcoin did and so i i sort of went down the rabbit hole um pitched my wife it's like hey we should buy a bitcoin miner <laughs> she's like no <laughs> cool what the fuck no um so i i went down deeper dove a little deeper and i was finally able to to convince her to let me buy this um well I, you know we bought it together partners right equal partners um it, yeah it, so it started as as sort of like this cool like okay i can buy a computer and just make money from it um it's sort of like real estate but a but a lower entry point 
Um, and then, and then COVID happened, Bitcoin crashed from like eight to 3000, you know, it was, it was kind of scary cause we had just started buying, um, and then the government started passing trillion dollar stimulus packages. And so I, <laughs> I learned really quick, but it, but it was sort of, uh, it was sort of like a, it, like a nihilistic approach at first almost where, where I'm like, you know, uh, like I, I get Bitcoin and I understand that it's going to go up a lot. So if we just ape into it now, we can sell it when it goes up 10 or a hundred X and, you know, fast forward net worth a couple decades. And, <laughs> yeah. but, but the deeper you go, uh, you know, you sort of get that conviction where the price doesn't even really matter anymore. You just need more Bitcoin. And so mm -hmm. when, when I saw that pump, uh, I think it was last week with the ETF fake news, I <laughs> mean, I felt sick, you know, I, was like, oh my I don't God. have enough, <laughs> I don't, you know, you never have enough. You're like, you're like, everyone's freaking out. Like, yeah, Bitcoin's going to win. I'm like, no, stop. I need it. I need it to like stay in this range for just a little bit longer. I need to reach this goal. Mm. But it's an interesting it's, dichotomy of I'm right. And damn, <laughs> or something. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's like, you're happy when it's going up, but you're also like, shit, I wish I had more, um, but it's, it's great because it's like, it's this self-reinforcing uh, positive feedback loop of incentives, right? And so, so okay, you want to protest the system, you put your money into Bitcoin. Well, you're going to make a shitload of money if you can hold on to it. And so it's it's beneficial. It's a beneficial productive protest. Hmm. And so when you say like uh, the, the, the first angle was kind of nihilistic as in, you know, number go up, we get, we, we, we get rich. So what, what was it that made you like not, not see the other stuff at that point? So just learning as you go or like, were there certain beliefs that, that you held on to? I mean, number go up is still important. It's, it's, I mean, it's the best marketing tool we have. Right. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I, I think there's, there's two, there's two things that come to mind, which, which sort of helped me dive deeper into like societal implications and why Bitcoin is so important. And so first one I remember vividly is hearing Brandon Quittam's pioneer species thesis and how Bitcoin is monetizing energy at the source and incentivizing infrastructure development in the third world. And so like, that is super cool, right? And, and theoretically, you know, you know and, and I've written articles recently where, where you have Bitcoin miners stepping in in Canada and the United States to revitalize uh, areas of, of the Rust Belt where globalization took away the manufacturing. So now you have high unemployment in areas with too much power. And so, you know, those energy companies have to constantly raise prices on population that can already barely afford to get by. Yeah. And so it's like societal implications like that. And then just, just Bitcoin fixing everything. Right. And so just tying back all of the problems to monetary debasement, um, Greg Foss's, uh, bond math and debt spiral concept, you know, where it's like, okay, well, if, if you tie it back, like how often do you think about the Roman empire? You know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that meme <laughs> yeah. where it's like, okay, as, as the Roman empire debased their currency further and further, society sort of fell apart because, you know, you're devaluing human time and you're breaking people's realities. Right. Mm. And so, so they can no longer sort of predict or plan for the future. And, and, and it just sort of destroys the soul of society. And if we can't, if we can't print money anymore, then, then maybe we could preserve that or fix that or, yeah. or at least hold it off for a bit longer. I think, I think that's already like a pretty deep thing that you went to pretty quickly, but I think this <laughs> is like, especially one of the things when you really go down the rabbit hole, I loved like the whole notion of once you see it, you cannot unsee it, right? Like there's no one. I've not seen anyone who like saw Bitcoin and then was like, no, never mind. Like th this is, <laughs> this is just not a thing. Um, but like the route you're taking, I also find very interesting, especially, you know, I think uh, it's, it's safe Dina Moose who talks about, you know, long uh, time preference and short time preference and that 
that the long time preference is basically stolen from us, especially if you combine it with, you know, like all the debt in America. If you look at the U.S. debt clock, you see that when you are born, you already have $100,000 in debt, which is not something you have to pay, but actually something that is also stolen from you in a sense, right? Like it's it's money taken from the future that that you can no longer have. So So even when you're born now, you will have a task of building or getting that 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 value or that wealth back in a sense but you are totally you know the system is working against you so that's why a lot of people are buying stupid stuff and have this short time preference basically and then when he talks about well when people can actually save their wealth in in time and space right they can have this long time preference which that's the thesis then right which leads to more prosperity and peace and collaboration and freedom and 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 all these things is is, is that what you also mean when you talk about this yeah yeah and i mean that really appealed to me at the start so i i i studied economics in in college and you know we had a little bit of discussion between keynesian and austrian schools yeah. But but it was it was mostly Keynesian, right? And and they would say, okay, well, risk free interest rate. How is it risk free? Because the government could default, right? Isn't that a risk? And they say, well, no, they can just print money. And I was kind of like, what the fuck are you talking yeah, about? Makes no sense, yeah. <laughs> like, isn't that isn't that like stealing? Isn't that terrible? Like, won't printing money like cause inflation? And they're like, no, there's too much demand for dollars. It'll be fine. We'll never get inflation. And it's like. Like that was kind of the first crack, right? Like you're going through mm -hmm. microeconomics and you're doing all these like calculus calculations with these stupid equations and you're like, okay, I can do the math, but like where the hell do these equations even come from? Like you're just estimating things or you're guessing things or you're just making things up so I yeah. can solve a math problem. And it, it just so much of it is just manufactured, right? Mm. And that 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 I find difficult. When when people talk about the economy, oh the the beast of inflation and blah blah, like it's coming from something else than another human's mind, basically, right? Like it's an engineered system, and you're and they are also yeah discharging the flaws, basically. You know, like if something like as you mentioned, if you if you ask that, then it's almost like a childish answer, right? Where in a, a, another another day in this study, as you mentioned, you are doing like crazy calculations but this answer to that very fundamental question is oversimplistic almost like yeah don't worry about that or something yeah that yeah that doesn't make sense it's so crazy yeah. mm. and so and, i mean yeah sorry ec ec yeah sorry uh I, I guess economics is just it's it's just exercise in logical thinking right but they try to turn it into a science and they use the science to justify policies that, that sort of empower them to make these these godlike decisions. And so in making these godlike decisions and in, in devaluing the currency, debasing the currency, you, sh you are devaluing the value of human time and effort. And you are lowering everyone's time preference to where we, you know, like the stock market trades off of one thing now, right? It's like, it's like, is the Fed going to print more money or not? It's it's just, it's us all one trade because everything has become so financialized. There's so much moral hazard built into the system that it's all just one big trade. Yeah, and constantly also, right? Like, uh, as you mentioned, like every, um, every Fed meeting or every announcement, every publication or whatever, like you have to constantly pay attention to what is happening with, the wealth that you have and i for me that's like very feels very risky right like i love that uh, i love i love that thought about that uh, i don't know who mentioned that i think it's um maybe it was luke broyles but he said like okay so you have a job or a venture and you take risk right Be because you choose to do that job or that venture but then when you're home your life is still influenced by people you don't know and they're basically forcing you to take more risk to mitigate the rules and and the decisions that that they basically make right so it's actually very life in general is made more risky and that's why uh i personally am into bitcoin because i don't like taking that risk right like i see bitcoin as a non-risk 
solution to, um, well, at least trying to protect my wealth, right? And I think a lot of people are not aware of the fact that they are a risk manager next to their job or venture, basically. Yeah, so the, 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 the constant devaluation of money makes everyone have to sort of turn into a part-time professional investor in order yeah. to just protect themselves and, and be able to live their lives, right? And so I save in Bitcoin because I am lazy and risk-averse. I don't... Yes. I don't want to save my money in, in a bunch of stuff with, with all this, you know, counterparty risk and, and debasement. It's like, okay, you invest in this company, the Fed decides to hike interest rates 300% and then the company's out of business. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so they, they, these companies can't even plan, you know, several years in advance because they have no idea where interest rates are going to be. Yeah. So when you say I'm I'm lazy and uh, I don't want to take that risk, like I have the same. And then I immediately think like this should be perfect for any human, right? Because humans are lazy. But I think nowadays it's kind of like I'm lazy, but I also want to become rich quickly, right? Uh, and, and so that's kind of how our society is now now shaped. I think people have the wrong... I, yeah, the wrong beliefs about money. Like, how, how do you see that? Like, how, how those beliefs shape shape the current society? Yeah, I, I think it ties back into that currency debasement, right? And so, the, I mean, one of the reasons why people are so into crypto and is like the same reason so many people buy lottery tickets and, and gamble, right? Is 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 ev everyone is struggling and, and it's becoming harder and harder for the government and, and the and institutions to hide the fact that that inflation is sort of running away from us right the currency debasement has has gone too far but they're going to have to take it even further and so people are feeling the pain and 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 they're not really sure why or what's going on but it's causing this sort of societal nihilism i guess that that attracts people into these get get rich quick schemes like like crypto like gambling and like like lottery tickets and because I, I think a lot of people feel helpless, you know, they've like, I, I, I know some people that have saved for years to try to get a house, but you know, fed prints money, house prices go up 30%. It's like, wait, what are you supposed to do? You know, mm. your savings are getting devalued every couple of years in these, in these accelerating cycles of currency debasement. Yeah. And so what for you, like, like, what I like when I talk to Bitcoiners, like you instantly kind of touch up on all these different dimensions that you obviously come across, right? When you go down, go down the rabbit hole, what was like the thing that actually made you see it? Like what dimension for you was like, okay, you know, you started obviously with, with the mining. Was it then the money printing in, in COVID when you, where you really saw it? Yeah, I, I, I think it was a combination of, of like the COVID restrictions and, and the money printing simultaneously where, you know, blanket decision was, you know, economies, businesses were destroyed across the entire world and the government just printed money to, to sort of stem the bleeding. You know what I mean? But but not everybody made it out okay. And so we were in sort of like this this quasi Great Depression scenario, but the stock market is is just screaming hot. And it's just because of the money printing. And so that that happened not not that long after I got into it, and it really just sort of solidified my conviction in Bitcoin and and sort of precipitated this this shift in perspective from bitcoin being like the get rich quick scheme like i like i had kind of initially characterized it at but but to a not get poor slowly scheme <laughs> yeah and, and so do you see bitcoin as as a technology just a technology or also as like uh like a philosophy you know like i I like the idea of, or well, kind of the contradiction of what we just mentioned. Like, if you're lazy, you should actually Bitcoin, but it's not a get rich quick thing. You like, you have to, it, it's very challenging, 
right? And you challenge your personal beliefs and your time preference and all these things. So how how do you see it, like as a technology or also also like that philosophical part? I, I think it's sort of the merge of both, right? If if you only view Bitcoin as a technology, you're missing the point entirely. I you know I had a uh, I had this wealth manager in Canada reach out to me who who wanted to talk about Bitcoin and he was going to you know pay me to do some consulting with them but when I got on the phone he wanted to talk about uh you know blockchain logistics with like you know global shipping industries and stuff and I'm like dude you you are so far off like you don't <laughs> even understand and so yeah. like the the technology is is just a piece of it right the technology is not new but the combination of the technologies that make up bitcoin is what makes it strong right at the same time is is yes it it, it is a philosophy as well of of you know upholding individual rights and freedoms and and making sure that individual value is is sort of preserved in the face of growing global authoritarianism and and increasingly volatile monetary policies and it, i i guess you can't in, in my view is is you can't you can't take bitcoin as just a technology but you i think i think to like truly grasp it you need to dive into the philosophical side as well because if if you don't understand why printing money is is sort of immoral then then you're never truly going to grasp bitcoin yeah i think that's also like one of the things that i encounter a lot that just that one thing you just said about you know printing money is immoral and changes a lot um changes your situation even while you're doing the right thing or you're saving for a house etc you know you're still confronted with these with this external um how do you say that like external influence into your life that well will never stop will always be there but you have never thought about it right what what does that say about the concept of trust you know i i love how bitcoin is super transparent and uh you know uh, as i said before like you have to walk the walk you cannot just talk you have to walk you have to walk the talk what, what does it say about our current concept of trust if people are not even shocked by the immorality of of this money printing I mean, I, I think I think they've just been conditioned to accept it. Um, they don't they don't really think about it, and so I, I I do think it's gotten to the point where a lot of people are starting to wake up because you know everyone feels like something's wrong and they can't really put their finger on it. You know, you see those pictures or not pictures, but but if you see videos from like TikTok on Twitter pretty frequently like the groceries where, and stuff yeah like, yeah like the groceries you know the women crying like i can't afford rent i can't afford this like how am i i you know i live i can't afford to live in the city i work in so my i commute for three hours a day and i have no life you know it's it's just it's 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 the cantillion effect it's inflation it's it's the money printing you know and it's just it's devaluing everything and and people are are i think they're starting to wake up to it but but a lot of people are still resistant yeah i find it there's so so many paradoxes right in the current state where this is also kind of laziness in a sense right where you think like and and also if I speak for myself, like I've said this multiple times on this podcast, like I, I think as a millennial in the Western world, I think we grew up in the best time to ever grow up from any person who ever lived, right? And things were just there. They were done for you. Everything always worked. Electricity, water, housing, like all, all these things. Like they're, the whole concept of no one is coming to save you we didn't really learn at least if i talk for myself right and so 
I think uh, is the video you you talked about about the commuting is that is that the one that went like viral today where the girl talks about you know this nine to five I cannot do it I don't know if you saw that one today but it's like she says the exact same thing like I commute for ninety minutes because I cannot afford to live in the city etc and you almost see that realization of them like this is not arranged for me I have a I have a very big um, I have a very big problem and I kind of recognize that laziness in there not it's not laziness on purpose but it's just kind of yeah it's being unaware almost right um i i actually also saw a video today of a woman who was like protesting and talking about i also cannot find a house and i have like study debt and blah blah and then there was this guy on uh, tiktok who then went to her instagram and then she uh, just went to Bali and like <laughs> another place and uh, taking photos for likes on uh, Instagram, etc. So like, what, like, what do you want? You know, do you have a problem or not? Like you cannot consume on one side and then complain on the other side. Right. And I, um, it's not really a question in there. It's like more reflection of where uh, it's so confusing. It's so paradoxical. Um, yeah how people operate right now. If I've heard millennials value experience experiences more than a lot of things. And so I, I, I think deep down a lot of millennials are deeply nihilistic. And so they, they spend money on, on experiences like travel and stuff like that while they're young because they figure if they save and invest, it's not going to matter anyways. You know, like we, you always hear social security in the United States is going to run out by like well before, you know, we get to retire. And so I, I think there's just like this, this societal malaise built in where, where people are just, they've gotten to the point where they, they don't even care to try anymore to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um because because things have gotten so difficult for them yeah but if we then take the take the leap to bitcoin right if we talk about bitcoin for millennials we want to help them discover bitcoin and adopt it there is a certain um part into being into bitcoin that that is about the self-custody is about autonomy is about um taking care of what you own, not using a third party to to do that for you, right? Um, I, I try to orange pill my friends from time to time, you know, like then I throw Bitcoin in again and I, I ask them questions like, okay, if you want to get 100K from the bank cash, do you think that's possible? And then they say, well, probably not today, but maybe in two days, but that's fine. It's just a nuisance, right? Like they don't really see it as a as a problem where I say, well, my point is that there's some, you know, there's a third party between you and, and that, and that what you own, but they don't really see that as a problem. They think it's all good. Like how, how, how would you approach? Well, I just want to say teaching people about that autonomy part. Like you have to be, um, autonomous and, and to become sovereign, to actually have more freedom, right. And, and more choices. What's your, what's your thought on that? It's it's hard it, it's hard to orange pill people who don't care about you know like the subject you're talking to right and so if I mean if they don't care about autonomy it, it's hard to sort of orange pill them using the autonomy thing um I guess I guess I'm not really sure how to answer this you know it's like so, some people don't care like my sister doesn't not give a shit about self custody right but she has a little bit of GBTC so it's like is that is that is anything better than nothing right and so if if someone really doesn't give a shit about the self custody piece maybe try something like you know maybe they care about the environment and you're like okay well these miners are you know mitigating methane all over the world they're sort of developing you know energy in africa and south america and like hydropower stuff like that i guess there's no there's no like one surefire way to orange pill somebody i i don't even really try anymore i i just sort of let them know <laughs> That I'm like yeah. the Bitcoin dude, and then you know whatever sort of context that they want to ask questions in, I can help guide them. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm the same currently. Like, as I mentioned, I just try again, right, from time to time, but I kind of gave up in some way. Maybe they call when it's 100K and they'll be like, okay, what is, <laughs> what is this thing? Maybe I need to get in. But yeah, for me, that's also been kind of the struggle also along the way like i uh like i love these people right like i want to tell them uh what i've discovered and what i've learned and what i cannot unlearn anymore and what i hope for them as well but yeah i i fully agree like they have to be open to it on one of the dimensions right to actually just pull a thread and then just yeah you know, start going down their own their own rabbit hole in a sense so who I also want to ask you, like, because of course you also have like an economics background and you learned more about the, the, the Keynesian part and the other part, like who, who or what has been most influential to, in, in, in like shaping your views on money and risk and, and wealth? I would, I would say, uh, Greg Foss and Preston Pish, I listen well, I guess Greg doesn't have his own podcast, but I've I've probably listened to everything Greg's been on, and then Preston Pish with, you know, like the macro analysis. It, it might go over some people's heads, but I but I find I find his his uh, I guess quantitative analysis with with you know sovereign debt and and markets really appealing. Um, and then I guess on the on the philosophical side, I've I've listened to uh, most of Robert. Breed love stuff, and so like those. I think, I think that's a really interesting way to to recontextualize money in a in a philosophical way. Yeah, the same people for me actually. Mostly, mostly Greg. Like I, I do not have an economics background or a finance background. Um, actually, hope to get Greg on the on the pod. We've been DMing, so it would be it would be fun. Like his energy is crazy, um, but I like I don't have that background, and he. And I think it's only like maybe four podcasts or something where he's been in. Like he really triggered me to like go deeper down that dimension, basically, right? Like I never learned anything about that, and and just like the past three years, I've been going down that rabbit hole, and it's just really inspiring. I think also because he's a bit older, like not old, but a bit older than 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 us and I think even the general like Bitcoin crowd and I think it's really cool to see that he spent like 30, 35 years in traditional finance and really turned his entire head around, right? Like a 180 and he understands where it's coming and where he's coming from, like what the problems are and all these things. And he now also sees the solution. So for me, that's also very admirable in a sense, right? Because it's really, it's really difficult to to drop beliefs that you think you have or or drop the things that uh, that you thought you learned and then really like go into the opposite direction so yeah cool you mentioned greg Foss. like i uh I, I love him too so and because you do again have this background like do you do you, when you think about like how bitcoin could change society and stuff like that i i i think a lot about like the current state of like finance and stuff like do you think capitalism is is like the most most ethical system we could follow or it, and, and like where we are now is that like the bad part of capitalism or is it totally not related no i don't i don't think we're in a capitalist society right now um it's like <laughs> No, I don't want to say this out loud. So, okay. <laughs> I, I, th I think, I think capitalism is. How do I say this? Is 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 the most moral system? Um, Ayn, Ayn Rand. So she wrote Atlas Shrugged and uh, a bunch of other stuff. But she, I think she does a really good job of of articulating like why capitalism is a is a moral. Um is a moral system and it's just every, everybody is pursuing their own self-interest and and in a, in a collective society collectivist society you know people people like to talk about greed and self-interest being a bad thing but if if the markets were completely free and everybody is is pursuing their own self-interest you know 
it, it, it makes society better. That's, that's what built America from, you know, mm -hmm. this like backwoods, you know, pioneers fighting Indians and in, in the West to, to an, an economic powerhouse, right? It was capitalism and it, capitalism is, is sort of, I mean, not, not everything's going to be equal, right? But, but a rising tide lifts all, all ships. And so there's, there's, there's room in capitalism to take care of the less fortunate through, through, you know, charities and stuff. But if you think about it, like, why do people give to charities right now? Uh, it's, you know, maybe a little bit because it makes them feel good. Well, does that mean they're completely altruistic or are they doing it for selfish reasons? Cause they want to feel good about themselves or do they want a giant tax write off? You know what I mean? And so it's just, it's, it's all self-interest, man. And, and self-interest makes the world go around and, it, and it's not a bad thing, you know, buy Bitcoin yeah. because you're greedy and you'll make the network more resilient and you'll make everyone who also buys Bitcoin better off too. I love that last part. So yeah, maybe, maybe Bitcoin is in some way also like, uh, now it's not a perfect capitalism, but I do like the reinforcing as you mentioned, right? Like it's not just for yourself, it's for the, for the collective as well. And I also, I, I don't really see like any, I, I agree that capitalism is the most ethical system you know in in concept at least right and and i love just simple examples of if we both have a bakery and my breads are better then more people buy my breads than your breads and then you figure out you know bread baking is not really my thing and i'm gonna explore something else like that yeah for me that's just rational sense right like why why would you pursue something that you wouldn't enjoy and you're not good at and if as a collective you're taking care of the collective then you will also have the space to find that thing where you can genuinely you know add value and and be good at so yeah in the concept i also think that capitalism is the best but but currently when you said about giving to charity i thought about tax write-off was my first thought yeah and it's again again it's like the walk the talk thing right it's 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 not real it's not altruistic and i think uh, especially in bitcoin a lot of things are actually very altruistic also um yeah like what you're doing with writing articles or what i try to do with uh, this podcast and other people try to do with books and conferences and stuff like that like it's to educate and help other other people to not only benefit ourselves but you know again also the the collective so um yeah i'm excited to see to see where that goes as a as someone who's spent time in the army and is currently still uh, in the army like are you familiar with the uh, with the software thesis of jason um, lowry a, a little bit i i know it's it's sort of uh controversial and so I, I've spoken to Jason about it and, and it, essentially it's a, a lot of people think that, okay, they want the military to like take up Bitcoin mining and, you know, sort of nationalize the industry. It's, it's not really that at all from, from what I've spoken to him about. And so the way I understand it is the United States promoting Bitcoin mining at a national level as a strategic imperative in order to maintain freedom of transaction for the United States. And so it's, it's not like a military branch where like, you know, mm. like the army is setting up Bitcoin miners. It's, it's more so a policy route where, where mining is is supported in the United States as a strategic imperative for for the country's economic livelihood, essentially. Yeah, and do you have any thoughts on it, or is just baseline understanding, and that's uh, that's it? Uh, no, no, contri no critiques. Um, I, I mean, I think I think any country who is hostile to Bitcoin mining will be regretting it dearly in the next like five to ten years. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, I I think Jason. So a lot of people are like, oh, he's a, 
he's not writing for you dummies. He's writing for like generals at the Pentagon, you know? Yes. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. not for you. Oh, like th- to clarify, I love it as in love, like how can I, but, but I, I thought it was super interesting actually. Like the whole, the whole criticizing, I actually, yeah, it's kind of like when they say like, oh, he's a government puppet or something like that. That's kind of where the critique came from. But I think how he builds up, you know, what he's talking about and his reasoning and argumentation, I think was, at least from my point of view, pretty solid and it makes sense, right? Uh, Where in essence, he says there's always power projection and then he has... examples of uh, animals right and that you know uh, lions go for the wounded zebra and they don't go for the elephant because it is more en- energy expenditure to get the elephant than the zebra etc and so that that is just a biological uh, like, like something in nature that is always there also between humans so war is more normal than peace basically so power projection is always there right and that the, like the next frontier after rockets and stuff like that is cyberspace and so that's where he talks about you know defending your own cyberspace through the computer network that is that is bitcoin right uh yeah i don't understand the critique but i wanted to ask you like what what your thoughts were but um yeah like we don't really have to get into it if 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 that's just that but uh yeah i was excited to hear that yeah yeah i mean no deep thoughts yeah Okay. Well, then, then we'll then we'll see what comes of it, right? Like, uh, yeah, he was writing it for generals and like a Pentagon briefing and stuff like that. So we'll see, we'll see if they listen. Um, and why do you think that that countries against Bitcoin mine who are against Bitcoin mining will regret it? Like, what's your thought there? I mean, at the base level, right? It's just it's just economic growth. So so you get the economic growth. You know the Bitcoiners are going to become probably like the richest population in human history. And on top of that, it's incentivizing energy growth. And so countries that ban or or, or are hostile towards Bitcoin mining are going to miss out on on a lot of the positive impacts that Bitcoin mining is going to have on the energy infrastructure. And mm-hmm. so in the next like ten, twenty, thirty years. I I don't think Bitcoin mining will necessarily exist as a standalone business, but rather it'll be integrated into the electrical infrastructure as a grid balancing tool. And so you know, any country who who is hostile is gonna miss out on that and then, you know, they're not they're not gonna have a solid economy because they're not going to have reliable power and power is yep. essential for human flourishing. And so, I mean, at the baseline that like Bitcoin's impact on, on power markets and energy efficiency is, you know, it's probably reason enough to, to leave it alone and let it flourish in the country all by itself. Yeah. Yeah. I fully agree. I, I also think that we could actually see that sooner than later. Um, with the current situation in the world and where energy is obviously uh, uh, um, could be used to um, put pressure right on other countries like cutting off countries etc and of course you also see that in a lot of countries also my country like the whole the entire energy grid is not even prepared to um facilitate all the like renewable stuff etc and and you already have examples especially like in texas where where the miners actually provide lots of value to to keep it stable so i agree with what you say i uh, yeah i think it 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 could be sooner maybe that's kind of also could also be like the surprise in a sense uh like that that entire dimension of bitcoin which i think yeah it's a study by itself almost how to you know, utilize that, and especially on like a like a country uh, country country level. So, um, I also wanted to ask you, as like one of the last questions, you know, if someone asks you what what is Bitcoin and why should I care, we kind of like had the, all these different dimensions. You know, where where would you start with answering that question, or where did you try to start before you? <laughs> It, it i i guess it depends right um it depends on who i'm talking to you know it a, a lot of times it'd be like bitcoin is a scam and you shouldn't give a shit 
you know, just leave me alone. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't say that. Um, I, I think if, if I know them, I'll, I'll sort of say something like, you know, like digital gold, right? It's just, it's just digital gold that no, with an absolute supply cap. Um, but it, it, it's hard to answer that without knowing who's asking the question because, because, you know, you could, you could contextualize it in the way that's most important to you and completely turn somebody off for, from Bitcoin for like the rest of their life. Right. And so it's, it's sort of a, a very high stakes question where, yeah. where, where when people ask me questions about Bitcoin, I, I usually answer the question with questions to, to mm. try to try to like dial in what they actually care about and what they're, what they're sort of looking for. And so with, with my sister, you know, I'll talk about like, like I wrote, I wrote an article about, Peru and how it's, you know, helping lift people out of poverty in Peru. Well, her husband is from Peru, right? And so that's sort of like this very personal touch that that can appeal to my sister. Whereas other people are just, you know, yeah, I've had I've had friends that sell their house and they're just sitting on like a pile of cash. They don't know what to do with it. I'm like, well, hey, maybe like put a little bit into Bitcoin. Um it's, it's savings. It's just, it's a long way. It's a long-term savings plan or, you know, other people, yeah. I have family that's criticized, criticized the, the energy industry. And so, you know, okay, well, Bitcoin is a way to make renewable energy, like more viable in, you know, integrating into the grid. And so it just, it really depends on who's, who's asking the question. Yeah. Yeah. Great examples. And yeah, I agree. I, I really try to switch from explaining to asking more questions, but I find it hard because I just love the whole, <laughs> the entire subject, right? So I just start talking and then, uh, but yeah, I love that angle. Like just, just ask, ask more questions. Um, all right. So last question I have, and I ask everyone uh, the same thing. What's a core belief that you will never let go? Trying to think about how to put this. It it sort of it sort of evolves around family. And so I I think with the millennials, like I, I don't have a ton of friends at work because I have three kids and they don't even have a girlfriend, right? And and so with, with the money printing you sort of get that nihilistic attitude where people don't look towards the future. They just live in the present and they're going out to bars and drinking stuff every night. And so I, I think, I think lowering the time preference and, and putting the focus on, on family in or in order to build something that is lasting is, is sort of a core principle. Right. And so I forget who said it, but it's sort of like, if you, if you want to change the world, raise good kids, you know, I, I I love that legacy. Yeah. Just low time preference, building a legacy. Love that, man. I, uh, fully agree. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a great ending. Um, yeah. Where can, where can people find you? Uh, you have a nice Twitter name. Um, and, and I, well, I'll make sure to link to your, uh, your articles as well, but, um, yeah, where, where can people, uh, learn more about you and, and find you online? Uh, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, tw- Twitter handle is, is in the name it's plebeius economist. I gave it about 10 seconds worth of thought. <laughs> Um, but in, in my Twitter profile, there's a link tree that has all my author pages and my, my link to my, uh, LinkedIn profile. So feel free to, to hit me up there if you want. Also, Ben, I'll make sure to link to everything and, uh, yeah, thanks again for, for this conversation and, uh, keep in touch. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.